you guys, Flickers of Fear time once again. Now, I think if you guys are on our Patreon, I think I might have announced that on uh, this particular Saturday, I was actually going to review Dario Argento's Bird with the Crystal Plumage, which I will get to eventually, I promise. But what ended up happening, if you guys have been watching the show and I've been having trouble with my internet connection, Bird with the Crystal Plumage, I actually don't uh, own on any physical medium, so I was going to watch it online, but because I've been having trouble getting online because of the move and everything like that, I decided instead I was going to push that back until later, and I was going to review a movie that I actually had on physical medium. So that's what I decided to do. So today, we are going to talk about a sort of lesser known Lucio Fulci film that not a lot of people kind of talk about, but for some reason I have a lot of, a really lot of affection for. I don't know, there's just something I really like about it. This is 1989's The House of Clocks. Now, what ended up happening with this? Um, so this is kind of like one of his later films. And like I said, it's one that not a lot of people talk about, probably because it didn't really get much of a theatrical release. What ended up happening was that, I guess Italian horror cinema um, in the 1980s was sort of going you know, downhill a little bit. And it seemed like a lot of the scary shit, a lot of the horror shit, like moved to TV. So it was like a big, a lot of big like Italian production companies were making um, horror for television, and uh, that's apparently what this was going to be. Um, there was like a, it was like a four. It wasn't a series necessarily, but it was like a series of four movies, and it was called Houses of Doom. And two of the movies were Lucio Fulci's movies, and two of them were by um, Umberto Lenzi. Uh, Umberto Lenzi's were, I believe, House of Lost Souls and House of Witchcraft. And the two Lucio Fulci ones were The House of Clocks and Sweet House of Horrors, I believe, was the other one, which actually I don't think I've ever seen. I've seen most of his movies, even like his lesser known ones, but uh, but I have seen The House of Clocks, and there's something I actually kind of really dig about it. It's very funny to me that <laughs> this was made for Italian television. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it aired. I think that this movie only got a theatrical release maybe in Japan, and I think it was like really hard to get hold of in the United States uh, for a while. Like, I got this DVD like, uh, geez, a long, long time ago. And I can't even remember like what company put this out. But for a long time, like in the US, it was kind of hard to get hold of just because it was made for television. It didn't really have uh, a wide theatrical release uh, anywhere on earth, really, other than in Japan, as I mentioned. And I think that's kind of a shame because even though, obviously like Lucio Fulci's later films, and we're talking about like Enigma, Demonia, stuff like that. Um, I, I kind of feel like they went downhill in quality a little bit, but I still think they're definitely worth watching. And I think that <laughs> the funny thing too is that I was going to say was that it's funny to me that this was actually made for Italian television because I'm like, wow, Italian television could get away <laughs> with a lot more <laughs> than American television could have at the time. This is like 1989. And uh, this is a, a House of Clocks is like actually pretty, pretty gory. Not, I don't think it's quite as gory as like some of his, you know, earlier shit, like the, you know, the Beyond or City of the Living Dead or whatever but it does have a really lot of blood and a really lot of uh, gore in it. And it's just like funny that they would show that on television. I don't know, that's just funny to me because they would never show that on TV here, like back in 89, like regular ass TV. So what we have uh, with this here is there's this uh, kind of isolated country house and it's, you know, it's like out in the middle of nowhere and it's occupied by this elderly couple, Victor and Sarah. Now, pretty much from the beginning of the movie, you know, like Victor and Sarah come across as very like, ooh, very, you know, kind of these kindly grandfatherly, grandfatherly, grandparently, I guess, type people. So they come across like that, but pretty much from the jump, you know that this is not really who they are because even in the first few minutes of the movie, you see them doing like some pretty fucked up shit. Now, one of the first fucked up things, actually the opening scene, is their maid or their housekeeper Maria and she sees she's kind of like creeping through the house doing whatever she does and she sees like blood all over the floor and so she follows this trail down and there's down in the basement or something like that there's like a chapel down in there and she opens the chapel door and she sees uh, a man and a woman in like wedding clothes and they're laying on these you know 
coffin, not coffins really, but just kind of slabs really in this chapel. And they have like these big, huge um, like nails like driven into their necks and they look all rotten and gross and everything. And then Maria is just kind of like, what the fuck is going on here, right? Because like, as you would. And uh, then she still like works there, but she's still, she's acting a little weird toward the old people now. Like, um, you know, what, what's with the dead people? I don't really get, but she doesn't say anything. Now, meanwhile, you see like Victor and Sarah going about their little day or whatever. Um, they call this the House of Clocks for good reason because Victor has been collecting clocks his whole life and he talks to them and takes care of them as though they're children. In fact, he refers to them as children many times. Like he repairs one and he's like, you take care and he just like puts them back in the thing. So you can see that they're a little like eccentric or whatever. But as I said, you can also see that these kindly old people are not as kindly as they would appear because there's one scene in particular very early on, not, you know, right after you've seen these dead people in the chapel, which at first you don't really know, like, who did that to them. But then you go to a scene where Victor is, like, uh, at the table and he's, like, kind of petting the cat or whatever. And then he looks over on the windowsill and he sees this sweet little bird, like, on the windowsill. And he's like, oh, and, he's, and he crumbles up some toast and, like, gives it to the bird. And then he takes, like, a fucking cane and just goes whack. And then he, like, throws it to the cat or whatever. So, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, aren't the coolest people ever. And then later on, you find out, like, a few minutes later, you actually find out that Victor and uh, Sarah were the ones who killed the people downstairs in the wedding clothes. These were their, I think it was their nephew and their nephew's wife. And you're led to believe, at least from Victor and Sarah's point of view, that the nephew and the wife came to live in the house, but were ungrateful, like were ingrates, all they wanted was their money and, you know, all this. Like I said, I don't know what really happened, but that's what uh, Victor and Sarah, that's how they interpreted it. So they decided that they were going to kill him and just put him down in the in the chapel and just kind of keep him down there for whatever reason. And uh, I guess the nail in there was supposed to keep them from coming back to life or something like that. I don't know. It's not entirely clear. So, so there's that whole situation going on. Now, you, like I said, you find out that these old people are kind of bad pretty early on in the film. So it's interesting then to see this, it's almost kind of giving me like don't breathe kind of vibes <laughs> where it's just kind of like a like a role re reversal type movie. But this came out like a long time before that. I'm sure it's been done uh, before that, but it's just every, whenever I saw don't breathe, I was like, oh, kind of like House of Clocks where, you know, the, the, where these people come because there's these sort of hoodlums. They're not, they don't really look like hoodlums. They just look like regular ass, you know, young people. But it's uh, two guys and a girl. And I guess Tony and Diana are like boyfriend and girlfriend. And then there's like the third wheel, whose name is Paul, who's kind of a dick. So they're driving around and you can tell that they're dicks like pretty much right away because they stop at this supermarket and like she goes and distracts the shop owner with like, look, I really want this kind of underwear or whatever. While the dudes like kind of steal the dude blind, right? Like steal like fucking pork rinds or whatever it is they're stealing potato chips mixed pickle i think he says what what they took but uh yeah so they're stealing a bunch of stuff they're smoking pot and uh and then they find this is kind of fucked up um they find a kitten in their car which is i guess like stowed away while they were in there robbing the store and paul decides hey i'm gonna put this kitten in a plastic bag and then We'll see how long it takes me to get out. It's like, hey, I'm giving you a fighting chance, little kid. I'm like, all right, kill that dude. So you already know these people are shitty. So apparently what happened was that Tony or Paul, I can't remember, but one of them knew the daughter of the gatekeeper at the house where Victor and Sarah live. And she's like, hey, there's these, you know, decrepit old people. There's like, there's nobody there except them and their housekeeper. And um, they have like all of this really cool shit in their house. Like they're really, really rich. They have like all this silver and gold and there's all this stuff and you can just like break in and take them out and just like take all this stuff. So that's what they're planning to do. They're driving out to this remote location and they're going to just break into the house, overpower the old people and take all their shit, you know? So that's kind of their plan for the day. So uh, what they do is that Diana, she kind of goes up to the door and, oh, I should mention, too, before this even happens, not only do the old people kill the nephew and the wife, but once they figure out that Maria, their housekeeper, has figured out that they killed them, then the old lady, Sarah, decides she's going to kill 
Maria too, basically by stabbing her right in the cooch with the big uh, pole, <laughs> the big wooden pole, and <laughs> all the intestines come out. It's pretty, it's pretty gnarly. So, uh, so yeah, so they have several murders on their hands, and they're just very. It's it's funny how um, just laissez faire they are about it. She's just kind of like, and she just like stabs her right through the fucking. Right, right through there, and then the old lady's just like, oh, well, that's taken care of, la, la, la. You know, it's just that kind of shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, I really like, I really like evil old people movies. So it's like, they don't make enough of those. But yeah, so so basically, what ends up happening is that the three hoodlums show up at the ho- at this remote house, and Diana goes to the door and basically gives the spiel about, oh, my car broke down, and, you know, I don't know where I am, I need to use, use your phone, blah, blah, blah. So the old guy is just kind of like, oh, okay, of course, of course. Like, you can come in and use the phone, and he wants to, like, make her a plate for dinner and everything like that, and he's being really nice uh, to her. But meanwhile, she's kind of, like, unlocking windows and signaling to her, you know, to her fucking degenerate friends, like, to break in there and do it. Now, what ends up happening after that, though, things go wildly awry, not at all like they planned. Uh, The two guys break into the house. One of them has a toy gun that they stole from somewhere. So they're like threatening the old people with it. Uh, what they didn't know, though, was that um, there was also another person on the grounds whose name is Peter, played by Al Cliver, who's been in a bunch of, uh, I believe he's a British actor, but he was in a bunch of um, Lucio Fulci's movies. He was in Zombie and some other ones. And uh, so he plays the groundskeeper who only has one eye for some reason. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think they ever, I, I don't think they ever explain like why he only has one eye, but he does. So he basically like pops in with a shotgun and like intervenes. And there's a struggle, there's a big fight and everything like that, and then it ends up that one of the guys gets the jump on Peter, knocks him over, Peter's gun goes off, and actually ends up killing Sarah. So at which point Victor, the old guy, gets really pissed off, and he starts like fighting with the other guy, and then the other, like one of the other hoodlums like picks up the gun and shoots the old guy. So now, uh, and the, then they also shoot uh, Peter, and kind of stuff him in a closet. It's interesting, I really like this part of the movie because you're kind of led to believe it's like, look, you know, the old people are bad because you've seen them kill several people and an innocent little bird, like in the first like 10 minutes of the movie. So you already know they're bad and you already know that the hoodlums are bad, obviously, because they've stolen a bunch of shit and they killed a cat that they didn't even really need to kill. And they're just like general douches all around. So it's kind of like you're you're like, oh, this is interesting. So you kind of think that when the hoodlums get to the house, you think there's going to be like a reversal, like the old people are going to kill them. But then the old people get killed like almost immediately. So then you're like, oh, I wonder how this uh, shit is going to play out. Well, that's when shit starts going supernatural. Remember how I said that Victor had collected clocks for a long time and talked to them and basically treated them like his children? Well... The clocks, I guess, are kind of in cahoots with Victor and Sarah because not too long after the uh, after the old people are killed, all of the cl- well, all of the clocks stop like the minute that the old people are killed, right? And this, it's not even just the clocks; it's the fucking hourglass. Even the sand stops in the hourglass. You know what I'm saying? So, this is some hardcore like time magical shit. So the time stops, and it's like the the hoodlums are just kind of like, huh, that's really weird. But of course they've just like, oh, well, we were just going to break in here and steal some nice silver and now we're responsible for a triple murder. So maybe, you know, maybe we have other concerns and uh, they can't get out of the house because the hounds have been released uh, quite literally. They have like a big pack of Dobermans and they're roaming around the ground. So the kids can't get out. So they're just like, okay, well, we're just going to have to like hole up here. We'll kind of stick the bodies in the bathtub or whatever. And then we'll hole up here until the dogs get tired and wander off and then we can leave and get the fuck out of here before anybody finds out what we did. So that's essentially what they do. Now, the clock's stopping is a prelude to time actually starting to go backwards. So for the remainder of the film, basically time starts going back, but it's interesting because the hoodlums are still in the house and they're kind of like wandering around being like, what the fuck is going on? And they find like the, 
the bodies of the nephew and everybody in the cellar. And then as they start to go around trying to get out of the house, they see that like some of the people they've killed, like Peter, the groundskeeper, like his body's not in the closet where they put him anymore. Like all the blood stains have vanished from off the floorboards. Um, the table is set the way it was when they first got there. So time is essentially reversing, not for them, but for everybody else. So all the people that got killed are coming back to life and it just kind of goes on like that. So basically the old people that you thought were dead that got killed like right away, because of the time, you know, the time distortions, uh, they actually end up coming back. And then there's kind of like a big struggle between them and the and the criminals that broke into the house. Uh, so that's kind of how that whole thing goes. Now it's interesting because there's just something about this premise that I really, really like. I not only like, cause I really like movies about um, creepy old people. And I really like these kind of like creepy old remote mansion type of things. It's not like, it's like a country house. It's not really like a mansion. And I also really like the whole reversal thing. Whereas, and I like the thing where it's like, there's really no good guys. It's kind of like, cause the old people are bad and also the criminals are bad, obviously. So you're not really sure in a way you kind of want the criminals to get it because even though the old people are bad, like, you know, the criminals are kind of worse and you know, what the fuck were they even doing? And they killed the cat and you know, I don't really have any patience for that. So, you know, that's the, that's that whole issue. But yeah, so there's just something about this that I have like a lot of affection for. I will admit, um, it's been a while since I've seen it. I watched it again, like um, not too long ago, like just earlier today for the review. And it is like a lot slower moving than I remembered, but that doesn't really bother me all that much. Like there is like a really long time of these criminals like wandering around in this house being like, oh my God, like my hand is injured and now it's not injured anymore. And where did all the blood stains go? And all the bodies are disappearing and stuff like that. But I don't know, there's just something I really like about the atmosphere of it. And I really, you know, the gore it's, it's low budget. Cause you know, this was made for TV. It wasn't a theatrical movie. Um, so it looks a little bit meh, but it doesn't, you know, it's not that bad. I mean, you know, it's it's decent by uh, Italian standards uh, and Italian standards for this time. It actually looks a lot better than some other things that I saw around 1989. So I'm not really complaining about that. Interestingly, though, what ends up happening is that time goes backwards so much that essentially because this I don't know, this is like a really weird like time loop kind of film. Because it's like, so they they basically like all the criminals like get killed because everybody that got killed, like the old people and the groundskeeper, they come back and then the criminals get killed. But then it, the time goes back so much that it seems like it goes back to before the hoodlums even go to the house because they're like parked outside it and then... Diana wakes up and she's just like, oh man, I just had the worst fucking dream. And he's like, yeah, man, so did we. We had like this crazy fucking dream. It's like, let's not go do this house now because they have like a bad feeling about it. And then they're just kind of like laughing about these crazy nightmares that they had. And they're kind of like explaining these dreams that they had to each other, like that were like scenes from the movie. It's like, yeah, this, the maid came back from the dead and like stabbed me in the stomach with this big, huge pole, which actually did happen. So they're, so they're like comparing dreams and they're kind of like laughing about it. They're like, yeah, let's not do this house. That's probably like a bad omen or whatever. But then the cat that the guy put in the bag at the beginning, like pops out of the bag and like starts going all over the car and it makes them crash and, it, and they all get killed anyway. So it's really, really weird the way there's like this whole like time distortion shit going on and I like that the cat got revenge uh and I, I mean I like that that kind of played out again like at the end of the movie because I was like yeah go kitty get him even though I think the kitty does die too I have to say because I, I had forgotten about that I thought the cat like jumped out of the bag and killed everybody in the car because they crashed and then I thought the cat survived, but I guess not because like in the last shot where they're pulling back from the car with all the blood and everything like that, there it looks like there's like a little dead cat over in the grass, which is was kind of upsetting. So I said it would have been way funnier if the cat would have just jumped out of the wreckage on this little tail switch and been like, that's right, fuck that shit. But you know what I mean? That's what I would have liked to see anyway. But yeah, so like I said, if you like Lucio Fulci movies, uh, this isn't, you know, obviously it's not one of his uh, best ones. It's kind of like one that he did later on in his life. Um, you know, he did it for television, so obviously he didn't have as much of the leeway, as much of the budget as some of the other stuff. But I definitely, definitely think it's still worth watching. I, there's just something about it, especially the guy that plays the old 
the old dude, um, the old dude, Victor, that dude, there's something like really creepy about that guy. He's got like a weird, I don't know. I think it's his eyes. He has like these weird, like kind of crazy eyes type glance. And it's just like him kind of doddering through the house, like, and just, you know, when he kills the bird and just like the look on his face and stuff like that, he's like really, really good. So this is kind of one I was reading. Uh, I have this book here that's uh, called Beyond Terror, the films of Lucio Fulci. And uh, so I was reading the part about House of Clocks in there. And it seems like, I mean, the author of that didn't really have too much patience for it, um, saying that it was kind of uh, lazy. I mean, Lucio Fulci didn't write the screenplay. He did write the story, but I think the screenplay adaptation was written by somebody else. But um, he was responsible for the story anyway. And I think that, you know, the author of this book kind of thought, well, you know, this stuff, his stuff got kind of like lazy later on. He didn't really have any internal logic behind any of his stuff, which seems like a strange uh, thing to say if you've seen some of his earlier classic films like The Beyond, which also didn't really have much internal logic. That was kind of one of his things. But, you know, it, it pointed out things like, oh, well, you know, the, the way the time distortion is working is not consistent. Like, um, you know, Diana gets her hand stabbed by the old lady, the like st hand stabbed through, and then it heals like a couple minutes later. Meanwhile, Paul, who gets shot in the chest, like his wounds don't heal that fast. But w when you're, I don't know, when you're operating under something like supernatural time distortion, I think you can kind of like give things a little bit of leeway. And I think the the, the thing about when they're when they wake up at the end uh, before it happened, I'm presuming, and they're comparing nightmares with one another and all their nightmares are sort of different because they each had a different experience in the house. So I think that you could just kind of explain that away. You know, yes, it could be lazy writing, but you could also explain it away as like, well, they each were, you know, at times they were separated, so they each had different experiences in the house. So, you know what I mean? So I, I, so I don't think, I don't know, it didn't bother me that much. I didn't really notice it really until I actually read, <laughs> until I read about it in that book. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess so. But you know, it, it didn't really matter that much to me. But yeah, so like I said, if you, um, haven't seen any of Lucio Fulci's lesser stuff. Like I said, it's it's not going to be as great as like Zombie or The Beyond or anything like that. But it does have uh, a lot of gore in it. It has like a really cool, like kind of a creepy uh, atmosphere. I just really, really like uh, the whole premise of like the time running backwards, like these these elderly people that seem very sweet and like your grand like your sweet grandparents on the outside, but are really kind of evil. And, uh, you know, and somebody breaking in the house and them just kind of like coming at loggerheads and the like supernatural shit going on. I just think that's a really cool premise. And honestly, I think it was like pretty well executed. Um, you know, no, it's not as great as some of his other movies, but as I said, it's one of my favorites of his uh, later films. And uh, I'm just surprised that it was made for TV. And I think more people should see it because um, I actually kind of I actually kind of really dig it. Um, so if it's, let me know if you've seen it and if you have the same affection for it as I do, because uh, I'm interested to know how other people uh, perceive this one, because I know it's one that I don't hear a lot of, even other Lucio Fulci fans talking about, but it's one that I like a lot. I also want to do, uh, at some point, I also want to do The Psychic, uh, because I really, really like that one. That's one of his sort of giallo movies. You know, I've always wanted to do that one too, because I feel like that one's really underrated as well, uh, just as this one is. So yeah, Lucio Fulci's House of Clocks from 1989. Check it out, or if you've already seen it, uh, let me know what your opinion of is it of it in the comments, and I will see you guys on the next Flickers of Fear. Bye.